Okay, uh, Nava, we're going to move on with the next presentation of our uh, formal schedule here. And we're going to turn to John Bertrand, uh, who originally is from the US, is a longtime civil servant in Quebec. Uh, he joined Nava in 2018, and John is presenting on vexillological notaphily. Uh, I'm going to talk about advancing uh, vexillology through notaphily. Uh, which is uh, well, actually, the, the collection of the collecting of paper money. I'll do a little notaphily 101. It's it's the collecting and studying of banknotes. A banknote or, or bill is it's a type of promissory note. I'm sure we've all seen banknotes before, uh, and it's a, they originally they go back to the uh, Song Dynasty in China. That's the the oldest. There's an example of one there. They were first issued in Europe. In, uh, in the 1600s by a bank in, in Stockholm. Uh, they were usually issued uh, at the time by commercial banks and uh, they were, banks were required to redeem them for a, a legal tender, usually gold or silver coin. And uh, I remember I was sitting right behind Edward Edwin Jackson in uh, San Antonio at, at a informal discussion session when he brought up his idea of advancing vexillology through philately. And I thought this was a very good idea. And I, and I mentioned that I was trying, interested in doing the same thing with currency, with specifically banknotes, advancing vexillology through notophily, as it were. And I remember Jelko Heimer, who, uh, who mentioned after that, to asked me to keep him informed uh, as to uh, where I was going with this. And uh, this is my attempt to keep you informed, sir. So sorry, it took a little while. Uh, so people have been people have been collecting banknotes since since the beginning of well since since they existed obviously, but it's a much younger uh, hobby than coin or stamp collecting. I got my Boy Scout merit merit badge for coin collecting, but there wasn't any badge for banknotes. And the, the term notophily was was coined, if I may, in the 1940s by employees of the Stanley Gibbons Company, which is a company that's an organization that's well known to stamp collectors. Uh, 1961 saw the founding of the International Banknote Society, which is the IBNS, which today is leading organization for collectors around the world. And by the way, it's a lot less fun than NAVA, but that's the way things are. Certainly the most influential person, the, the Whitney Smith, if you will, in the world of notophily was Albert Pick. He's a German national. He, um, he amassed a collection of over, over 180,000 banknotes. In 1964, the collection was received by the Bavarian Mortgages and Exchange Bank, and Mr. Pick was retained as curator in the service of the bank from 1964 to 1985. He lent his name to the Pick numbering system, whereby collectors can unambiguously uh, identify and catalog each banknote. And aside from many articles and books he published, his best known work is the standard catalog of world paper money. Obviously, there are many thematic collections of banknotes. Uh, notes bearing the portrait of Queen Elizabeth II come to mind. Uh, there's also different, different continents, flora, fauna, engineering feats, and, and whatever. But I've never come across anyone specializing in flags although it seems impossible that there are no such collections. Maybe some of you have one. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, uh, there is no equivalent that I know of, of the ATA, which Edwin Jackson mentioned in his article in Vexillum, uh, which is the American Topical Association in, in the world of notophily. I've contacted the IBNS about that, but so far, so far nothing and nothing's changed. So why should all of this interest us in Nava. Well, it's about flags, basically, and we do flags. Nava is a, re a repository of flag-related material and knowledge, flags, literature, artifacts, all kinds of anything related to flags. It should play a major role in the preservation of these banknotes, at least the creation of a database, uh, which goes, somebody earlier mentioned the uh, preservation of knowledge, and that fits with that. Uh, NAVA is also involved in an ongoing process to have vexillology taught in schools as part of a social sciences program. And I feel that vexil vexillological notophily and philately should be a part of this effort. Flags and currency <clears throat> are powerful symbols of modern statehood. The symbols appearing on a nation's currency don't get there in a haphazard way. They're chosen and approved by a governing authority. 
they provide banal reminders of, na of nationhood. They're flagging and unflagging me. Despite remaining largely unnoticed in daily financial transactions, they become internalized as a second nature and forgotten as history, a living, unremembered collective memory. I've spoken to people recently, they couldn't tell me what was on a Canadian $10 bill, for example, but they can identify, they know what a $10, they can identify a Canadian $10 bill anywhere. What I'm proposing is, is a creation of a working group to collect and catalog these images and information, interest area meetings, to share the information, occasional articles in vexillum, to highlight notes of particular interest as well exa as examining the possibility of collaboration with other organizations such as the IBNS or Flags of the World, for example. We've all heard <clears throat> the, the, uh, the expression that pictures worth a thousand words. Well, here are a few pictorial examples of what I've been talking about. I've categorized flags on currency into three different groups. There's type one, which, which, are, which I call like incidental flags, because uh, many banknotes feature images of buildings that are important to the, to the nation, the presidential palace, the national legislature, the central bank. It's normal to see flags flying over these buildings. They're usually very small and mostly of little importance per se, but occasionally, on, on uh, type two, <clears throat> sorry, on these flags, the note is, uh, on, on these notes, the flag is used as one or perhaps several national symbols. It's on the note, it's clearly visible, and it's an important symbol. It's type three, on these notes, the role played by the flag is more important. It is sometimes central, in fact. They're often, but not always, commemorative notes involving the creation of the national flag, the first raising of the flag at independence ceremonies, major battles, et cetera, et cetera. So let's look at a couple of type one flags. We have here a Canadian $10 bill. We have a, a detail of a Canadian $10 bill, the Houses of Parliament, and a flag on top of it. A very large percentage of the Canadian population lives close to the American border. Canadians are sometimes very touchy and sensitive about their national identity and the influence of the giant next door on their culture. More than once, the introduction of a new banknote has sparked debate and controversy. It always involves the image of the flag that's shown flying over the parliament buildings. A new $5 bill was introduced in early 1986. It's the American, it's the American flag, people said, but no, it wasn't. The Prime Minister appearing on the bill was Sir Wilfrid Laurier. When he served, the Red Ensign was Canada's flag, and that's the one on the bill. Later that year, a $2 bill was introduced. Again, the American flag. Again, no. It was established that the maple leaf flag flying next to the Queen's head was Canada's current flag. Okay, then. Problem settled once and for all? I'm afraid not. Three years later, a new $10 bill was issued and the controversy came racing back. The Canada-US free trade agreement had been implemented earlier that year and many, many Canadians were very unsure about this agreement and its effect on Canada's economic sovereignty. When they saw what looked very much like the American flag on the bill, this was seen as a deliberate subliminal attempt to get Canadians to join the USA. Demands were made in the House of Commons to have a new banknote withdrawn immediately. Again, it was established that it was indeed the Red Ensign and the note stayed in circulation. But if you look really closely, so those type one notes, the ones with often very small flags flying over buildings, which usually are incidental and often of limited interest, well, it depends. These notes and the controversy surrounding the flag on them tell us an awful lot about Canada and Canadians. Next up, we have the American $10 bill, which shows the US Treasury building with the flag prominently flying over it. Then there's the $20 bill with the White House, also with the flag. And we finish with the $50 bill, the Capitol building with the flags on either end. They're a little smaller, but then that's a huge building. And then, my goodness, are those red ensigns flying over the, uh, the Capitol building? I don't think anybody ever raised the question. Couple of final notes here. Here's a $50 bill from the Bahamas showing the central bank, which has the 
Bahamian flag flying over it and the flag of the central bank. And we have another note from Argentina now, 50 pesos note, which has the Argentine, Argentine flag flying over the Casa de Gobierno to government house. And that's it for the type one flags. We come now to type two flags. And we have here a Russian 5,000 ruble note. The red banner of the USSR was lowered from the Kremlin in Moscow on December 25th, 1991, the day before the US, USSR was officially dissolved. It was replaced by the Russian flag of white, blue, and red. The first banknotes issued by the Russian Federation occurred on July 14, 1992. They featured the Kremlin Tower topped by a five-pointed star. The five-pointed five star was also used as a watermark. These symbols still evoke the former Soviet Union. On March 12, 1993, a new series of banknotes was issued. These were very similar to the previous notes, but there were some significant changes. The image of the Kremlin Senate Tower with the Russian flag flying over it had replaced the former images of the, the five-pointed star. And even the watermark had changed, although we can't see it. The tower and flag replaced the star there as well. Other former Soviet republics were placing their new flags on their currency as well. Here's an example from Kazakhstan with the flag up in the, actually, well, it's, it's a vertical bill, but the flag is up in the top right corner there. And here's one from Tajikistan with the flag over on the, on the corner here too as well. And on top of the, uh, the building in the, uh, in the center. These three notes were issued by countries that had just gone through major changes. The, every, the, for, the USSR was dissolved, it was broken up, new countries were, were formed, new senses of belonging and nationhood had to be created and the flag and the currency played an important role in that. Here's a note from Burundi, a 500 franc note from Burundi featuring the national flag again. Burundi is a Central African nation whose population is made up of two main ethnic groups, the Hutu majority and the Tutsi minority who control the army and economy. Despite these two groups being culturally and linguistically related, the country has experienced much ethnic tension and violence since achieving independence from Belgium in 1962. Violence again flared up in the, in the 1990s. And since then, the government has been facing the task of quelling dissent, promoting unity and rebuilding the nation. Again, the currency and the flag play a major part in that as well. And here is a, uh, okay, this takes us to the uh, type three flags. Here we have a, a note from Bahamas that uh, commemorating the quincentennial of the first landfall by Christopher Columbus in 1492. The, bah the Bahamian flag is featured prominently on both sides of Columbus's ship. Here we have from Haiti, a 10 gourd note from 1991 celebrating the creation of the first Haitian flag. The note features Catherine Flon seated as she shows the Haitian flag on May 18, 1803. Ms. Flon was the goddaughter of Jean-Jacques Dessalines, a former slave who united forces with Alexandre Pétion to successfully revolt against the French colonial army. At the Congress of Arcaille, she tore off, well, it was actually Dessalines who tore off the white part of the French flag, leaving only the red and blue parts. These were sewn together, thus creating the first flag of the Republic of Haiti. The coat of arms in a white square was added in 1806, and every May 18th, Haitians celebrate National Flag Day to honor their forefathers and show national pride. Here we have a 50,000 pound or livre note issued in 2013 to commemorate 70 years of Lebanese independence. On the back of the note, we see the flag super, the national flag superimposed on a, a, a map of uh, the country of Lebanon. On the front of the note, we see a very stylized version of the national flag along with the depiction of the Rashaya Citadel. The Citadel has a long history and is now used by the Lebanese army. In 1925, it was the site of the Great Druze Revolt when 3,000 Druze surrounded the fort and the French legionnaires inside until they were rescued by French reinforcements. Under the, under the French mandate on November 11th, 1943, many Lebanese leaders featured including a, a future president and prime minister, were arrested and held there by the French. 
This led to a creation of much local and international pressure for the release, which they eventually were on November 23rd, 1943. And that day was declared Lebanese Independence Day. We have another note from Lebanon, another 50,000 livre note. And this, uh, this is to uh, commemorate 70 years of the Lebanese army. And we see a soldier carrying the national flag. Now come to the Philippines and an interesting 20 pesos note that was in use from 1949 to 1969. It's interesting because the back shows the flag adopted by the Magdalo faction in Cavite in 1896. General Aguinaldo's flag bears the letter K or Ka from the pre-Hispanic Philippine alphabet Tagalog. It represents the KNK, a revolutionary society founded by, founded by anti-Spanish colonial Filipinos in Manila, Manila in 1892, with the express goal of gaining independence from Spain by revolutionary means. The eight rays represent the, um, the, first, the first eight provinces to rise up against uh, Spain in revolt. Again, this, when this note came out in 1949, World War II was still a very recent event. Uh, the Philippines had faced devastating occupation by Japanese forces, and they seemed to be saying that, well, we, we fought and died to build the country before, we can do it again. Now we go to Argentina. Argentina has many banknotes that feature flags. Here are but four examples. First, we have a note portraying the founding of Buenos Aires by Juan de Garay in 1580. The flag portrayed is the royal banner of Philip II of Spain. The scene was taken from a painting by Jose Moreno Carbonero, and we see it in more detail here. The next note, ironically, commemorates the Spanish being expulsed from the area. It celebrates the El Obrazo del Maipu. In the Battle of Maipu on April 15, 1818, Argentine General Jose de San Martin destroyed Spanish forces and completed the independence of the core area of Chile from Spanish domination. The scene shows the meeting of Argentine and Chilean forces. The note is interesting because the flag being shown is not the Argentine flag, but it's the flag of Chile, not Texas, Chile. And it's, you don't see very many examples of bills and currency featured from one country featuring the flag of another country. The Philippines have put the American flag on there to celebrate the, the unique relationship they've had with the United States, but it's a very rare occurrence. There we have the, uh, the, the painting that inspired that, that scene a little more in detail there. All right, the next bank note commemorates the Battle of the Vuelta de Obligado, a naval battle which took place in 1845 on the Parana River between the Argentine Confederation led by Juan Manuel de Rosas and a combined Anglo-French fleet, which in 1845 was a formidable opponent. It was part of a larger action in which the Anglo-French forces were blockading the river plate. Although the attacking forces eventually defeated the Argentine naval forces and overran the land defenses, the battle proved that foreign ships could not safely navigate Argentine internal waters against its government wishes. The battle also increased popular support for de Rosas and his government. Now you see in here, the flags are kind of hard to identify and you have furled flags over here. The painting that, in, that inspired this, the flags are much more visible. You have the Argentine flag over here and they removed all that from the, from the banknote, which is curiously why, but I, there it is, it's not there. Now we come to a, a note that I like particularly. It's the currency equivalents of having the book thrown at you. They're, they're commemorating the Falkland Islands War between Argentina and the United Kingdom. First of all, we see the color scheme, which is blue, white with the golden sun, recalling the uh, Argentine flag. We have a map of the, the islands. We have a map of his Latin America because it includes Mexico, which is part of North America, Central America, South America, the Argentine Antarctic Territory and the Caribbean an albatross, which is a bird common to the South Atlantic and possibly a little nod to uh, certain literary associations. And on the other side, we have the Darwin Cemetery, the Argentine war dead cemetery on the islands, 
the light cruiser General Belgrano, which was sunk by the British during the war. And we have the gaucho waving the Argentine flag. Now, although we see the, the gaucho from the side and the back mostly, it's not a, it's not a, a, a generic anonymous gaucho. It's Antonio Rivero who was involved in the Port Louis murders in, 1883, in 1833. He's, he's a somewhat controversial figure who is seen by revisionist historians in the public consciousness as a patriotic hero who rebelled against the British. However, academic historians in Argentina and abroad agree that his actions were not motivated by patriotism, but mostly by disputes over pay and working conditions with the representatives of Louis Vernet, the former Argentine political and military commander of the Malvinas. So here we have a note that commemorates the Falkland Islands War and throws everything possible at you, including the flag. Again, they, if the government wants people to remember the, uh, the, Argent the uh, Falkland Islands War, they've done a pretty good job here. And now we come to Fiji. And, and again, a couple of banknotes that I like particularly. Uh, October 10th is Fiji Day. And a new flag was supposed to have been unveiled on Fiji Day in 2016. But something happened, something big. That's something was Fiji winning rugby gold at the Olympic Games in Rio. Fijian Prime Minister Frank Bainimarama had long campaigned for a new flag. He felt that the country needed a new, more indigenous and truly Fijian symbol to honor. A flag design competition was held in 2015 to come up with a new design and 23 proposals were submitted. However, resistance from the opposition and parliament was staunch. In February 2016, they maintained that a flag change was not what the country wanted. The flag was highly revered and dear to the public of Fiji. The Prime Minister refused to let a referendum decide the matter. In March of that year, Prime Minister John Key lost a referendum as New Zealanders rejected changing their current flag. The Fijian flag question was delayed with no real news about a decision. On August 11th, Fiji won rugby gold at the Olympics. They defeated no less than Great Britain, 43-7. The nation erupted with pride and happiness. Fijian flags were waved vigorously in the stadium in Rio and for days afterwards all over Fiji. Six days later, an announcement was made by the prime minister's office. It read, it, it has been deeply moving to witness the way Fijians have rallied around the national flag as our rugby sevens team brought home Olympic gold. It has been apparent to the government since February that the flag should not be changed for the foreseeable future. Also, the government said that money would be better spent on the recovery from tropical cyclone Winston, which had hit Fiji on February 20th, 2016, killing 44 and leaving thousands homeless. This was a very popular decision. When we, we can all see and all note the prominent position of the Fijian flag on the world's only $7 banknote. In fact, it was nominated for Banknote of the Year by the IBNS in 2017. Okay, the second banknote from Fiji was issued in 2020 to commemorate Fiji's Golden Jubilee. The intent, the intent was to showcase Fiji's diversity as an independent nation and to emphasize elements from its past and future. To symbolize its rich history and renewed ambition for a brighter, more prosperous and more inclusive Fijian future. The flag played a, a very large role in this as well. On the front of the note, we see the first raising of the Fijian flag at 10 o'clock on October 10th, 1970. On the back, we see a group of ethnically diverse children smiling and moving forward. One of them is carrying a large Fijian flag. The others have small hand flags. I think we can safely conclude that the Fijian flag question has been solved and been resolved for a long period of time. We can go on to other kinds of bills and notes as well. These are, these were, uh, Occupation notes uh, issued by the military, uh, the, uh, the military occupiers in France at the end of World War II, and we can only imagine how the French felt seeing the uh, tricolor on, on payment certificates after uh, several years of, of Nazi occupation. There's also the question of Nordgeld, which is German um, emergency money, which was issued in inflationary Germany after the uh, after the First World War. Which, which has a multitude of, of flag images. And uh, again, that's a whole different world again. So thank you very much for your time.
I hope I've been able to to spark a little bit of interest in 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 this field and and uh, get something going as far as interest groups and everything else. Uh, one question uh, to you is: What if anything from numismatics can you bring over to what you propose for uh, the study and and uh, using banknotes and things for vexillology? Well, numismatics is, is it, it's it's currency as well, and uh, there there are many. Canada has a lot of of, of interesting. Uh, coins with featuring flags and the use of color and everything else and that's uh, th that's certainly valid as well because it's it, it counts it's, it's about flags and it counts and uh, but i'm i'm more interested in banknotes because they're with with printing technologies and everything else they're they're beautiful works of art on their own you know they, i'm talking about flags but they they could be about any other subject and some of them are really extraordinarily beautiful yeah? oh numismatics, absolutely Yes, uh, I was. Care. Yeah, I was just wondering if there was anything that folks in in uh, numismatics that that what things that they may do for educational purposes or research mm -hmm. or things to connect. Uh, do you know if anyone uh, no knows, uh, flag uh, studies or what have you in in numismatics? No, nope. no. Nope. Nope, okay, right. okay. Like I uh, said, Edwin, Edwin Jackson mentions all of the ATA, which is the American Topical Association, which catalogs different areas of interest and everything. There, there is nothing in the, in the banknote world or I've never encountered it. And maybe it's time to get something going for that. It very well could be, and and good luck with uh, with the effort. Hopefully, you might consider hosting uh, an interest area meeting and I am on, on the subject to, uh, to get uh, your idea rolling. That was discussed and I'm ready to go. All right. Good to hear. Good to hear. And if you need any help with that, just get a hold of uh, either Amber uh, or myself, uh, and we can help you uh, get that started. Okay. Thank you again, John. Uh, great stuff with, uh, with what you presented. And as I mentioned, lots of comments uh, for you to consider in the chat. Mm -hmm.